book of Psalm chapter 51, and uh, we want to go to the Lord this morning and go to His Word to find help and direction and uh, chart the course for us that we need to be going on as we begin this very first day of the year. Uh, I'm thankful today for every blessing that the Lord has given to us. I join with Benjamin Franklin when he said we need to be at war with our vices, at peace with our neighbors, and let every near every year find you a better man. And that would apply certainly to every woman in this building. Be at war with your vices. Be at peace with your neighbors. And let every new year find you a better man or woman. And uh, that is something that we should be resolute in the pursuit of, that God would help us to be better than we were the year before. This morning, if you have your Bible, the book of Psalm, chapter 51, have mercy upon me. O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me with snow. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. There's something very powerful that I feel like the Lord has drawn my attention to. And it's the fact that this very psalm became a defining moment in David's life. He could have been known as David the adulterer, David the murderer, David the outcast. But it became a defining moment for David. And he's known as the man after God's own heart. Because he refused to let his sin define him. He refused. He went to the only source and resource for life that he could go to. And it was in this particular psalm that David had a defining moment. That his sin would not define him. His mistake would not define him. But rather, he would be defined by a mercy that touched him. And by a mercy that saved him. Where would any of us be today if it was not for the mercy and the grace of God? We have had defining moments and we will continue to have and need defining moments in our life. Moments that will define, will we collapse and die in this? Or will we go forward with faith and move into the next dimension that God has said we can have? May we answer that question today with a a life of commitment 
with a renewed determination that I will not allow my mistake to define who I am. But I will move with faith and hope and courage into the future that God says is mine. I'm preaching this morning from this subject, defining moments. Defining moments. Would you lift your hands and pray and ask God to let this be a defining moment in our life. Let this day be defined by the mercy and the grace and the impact of it. Lord, may our life forever be changed. May our hearts be changed by our soul. May our souls be changed today. Cleanse us as we approach the communion table, remembering the blood that you shed and the body that you offered, a sinless sacrifice. God, there there is not one of us in this building that can make that declaration. We was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But I am thankful that grace is defining us, is defining us. Not our sin, but your grace. Not our mistakes, but your grace. We thank you for it today. We praise you for it today. We give honor to you today. And everyone said, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Would you just put everything down for a moment? And would you help me worship the Lord one more time? Would you help me praise Him in your own manner, in your own way? If it's a lifted hand, if it's a clapping hand, whatever it is, Lord, we praise you and we thank you today. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you and you may be seated. History records in the Word of God that many of the men and women in the Bible were not people of perfection. They were marred. Their lives were marred by mistakes, by tragedies, and by many situations that many of us have gone through. When I begin to think of how David, uh, the mighty man, the warrior, the man that came up on on the scene of the battle realized that his brothers were acting like cowards. Immediately, a man with a shepherd's heart, a man who was a shepherd, who loved sheep and never, never left them in a time of trouble. When the lion came, he was there. When the bear came, he was there. If an enemy came, he was there. And so when this uncircumcised giant uh, began to make a declaration and defy the armies of, of Israel, it got into a spirit. And he questioned within himself, why would anybody uh, in covenant with Jehovah be afraid of anything that was out of covenant? And it was that boldness and that declaration that made a ruddy, freckle-faced boy challenge a nine-foot-tall Goliath And he did it on behalf of the God that he served and worshipped. He would not uh, back down and bow down and could not realize why that day it was not the champion of Israel fighting the champion of of the Philistines. And it uh, it was a defining moment for him in his life. The boldness and the courage. God that gave me the bear and the lion will also give me this uncircumcised Philistine, this out-of-covenant enemy of Israel uh, that's defying the armies of Israel, making mockery of us, God will give me His head today. It was that kind of boldness uh, and that kind of courage that we preach about. We love preaching about David the worshiper. And uh, he was a man that, uh, in spite of his... Uh, kingly robes in his kingly position. He knew that Israel would never have victory until they got the Ark of the Covenant back in their possession. And so David made that first on his list. I won't be a king of Israel without the covenant of the Lord. I must have the presence of God. And he went and he got that Ark and he took it back. And uh, at first it didn't work well because Uh, They tried to do it with a Philistine technique. They put it on a new cart and they pulled it and tried to make 
the presence of God, some mechanical machine that would be pulled mechanically behind an individual. And they found out when you tried to steady what God doesn't need help steadying, suddenly a man uh, was stricken with death. And David, uh, again, began to pursue, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? And he didn't allow that mistake to define him. He didn't allow that mistake of the people to define him because he was a man that had courage. And in spite of losing a man over it, he went back to the drawing board and said, God, what in the world did we do wrong? And he said, you, you've got to get the Levites. You've got to get the priest. You've got, to, you've got to get them and you must sanctify yourself in order uh, to bring uh, this cart home. And so they did sanctify. That's what this day is all about. It is a recommitment to sanctifying our hearts and our lives and and recommitting them. David's life after that was marred by mistakes. And I wondered, what what put David in a position to commit adultery? Could it uh, have been that possibly he was exhausted? He was mentally fatigued. Is that why he stayed home and thought, instead of going to war when he should have been leading the army uh, into warfare, he stayed home. And in the weariness of that moment, possibly fatigue had set in, he looked out of his window and when he did. But the point that I want to emphasize today, that people don't preach about David the murderer. There, there are people that reference it like I'm referencing it today, but you're, you don't talk about David the adulterer. Nobody's preaching or because he's not defined as the adulterer. He is not defined as the murderer, though he did. Uh, Moses is not defined, or Abraham is not defined as the liar, but he did. There are many people that, that made mistakes in the Bible, but they are not defined by their mistakes because they live beyond their mistakes. They live long enough that that something else could define who they are. And their, their imperfections did not define them. I think that is very important as we are closing one year because there is not any of us that have been perfect this year. And we all see areas that we... Uh, need to improve on in areas that uh, we need to take another look at. There, there's nothing wrong with assessing and looking back and, and, and reflecting on, well, we should have maybe not did that and did this instead. I am not against reflection, but we cannot live in uh, the condemnation of yesterday. David could not live, had lived, in the condemnation of his guilt and his shame and became uh, a a, a person that was defined by something greater than that. If he would have continued in that life of condemnation and guilt, he would have died in his dilemma. But he had to move on. And I would say that many of us... uh, uh, can be arrested by the mistakes of a year or the mistakes of uh, six months ago or the mistakes of ten years ago. But somehow, if the Lord could help me today, there was something that redefined David. There was something that made him other than the murderer. There was something that defined him uh, more than an adulterer. And it was his prayer of repentance. It was his psalm of sincerity. It was his heart was clean and pure in the, in the, in the presence of Almighty God. And he began this psalm by saying, Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Upon me, O oh God. If there was ever a day that we needed the mercy of God, we need the mercy of God this morning. 
I need the mercy of God. This church needs the mercy of God. Our families need the mercy of God. Every preacher in this city needs the mercy of God. Every saint of God needs the mercy of God. I need the mercy of God. I desire the mercy of God. I want the mercy of God. I can't live. I can't breathe. I can't, I can't get up and move beyond my condemnation if God is not merciful. David knew my days are numbered if you don't show me mercy. If you don't give me mercy that, that I don't deserve, then, then there is no way that my life can continue. And he said, have mercy upon me. According to thy loving kindness, not according to my guilt, not according to my shame, not according to my, to my life, but according to thy loving kindness. He was appealing to the heart of God. He was appealing to a God that could feel uh, the need of mankind. He was appealing to the heart of God that could bleed for broken humanity. And he said, uh, and unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. He was appealing that God would be tender with him. And he could expect possibly God to be tender with him because he was tender with whatever he was over. He was gentle and fought on behalf of whatever he was over. So he is appealing to his, his loving kindness. And he is appealing to his tender mercies. And then he said, blot out my transgressions. Don't just move them back, but blot them out. They talk about that there was a, a, a solution that could be placed upon ink that would make the paper literally go clear. What David says, the ink that I have written by my own finger and with my own mistakes, the history that I have made of my own life, I'm asking you to take one drop of your blood and blot out the ink of my negative history, the ink that I have written with the pages. I am so thankful today that God can blot out the pages of history. He is the author and the finisher. He can put in what he wants and he can take out what he wants. And David said, I want you to blot out everything on my page that doesn't need to be there. And he evidently, Brother Lux, tapped into something that God appreciated. And he said, that's right, David. They won't be calling you David the adulterer. They're going to be calling you David the man after God's own heart. Because I will hear you. And I will take my finger. And I will blot out every one of your transgressions. I'm going to give you a future, not a past. I'm going to eliminate everything. Oh yes, you're going to have to pay a price for the mistakes you've made. There will be some judgment. There will be some penalty. But you will be redefined because you have a moment of repentance. And this moment of repentance is going to realign you. It's going to redefine you. It's going to make you who I say that you are. So they won't be calling you the murderer. They're going to be preaching about you at youth camp. They're going to be preaching about you everywhere. Because this defining moment, I, I don't know if it's touching you like it touched me, but I have been defined many times by the mercy of God that I did not deserve. I have been defined by his loving kindness and his tender mercies. And just one trip to the altar and blot out. I'm talking about taking it off of the page where you come back to God and say, God, would you please forgive me for when I le left, you didn't leave. Did you leave? I don't even remember you leaving. You, you mean, what, what are you talking about? I don't even know. I blotted that out the day you came crawling on your knees. I took that out of the page. It's not even recorded in the history of your past mistakes. I have washed you. I have cleansed you. I have sanctified. I wish somebody would help me get a little happy and thank him that his holiness and his wonder
wonderful mercy and grace has blotted out the transgression of my soul. Oh my. He started appealing to the loving kindness of the Messiah. He started appealing to the mercy of God. He said, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. I'm not, I'm not denying that I committed it. I committed it. I'm not trying to hide from the fact that I did it. I just want to be washed thoroughly. I want you to wash me and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Oh, could it be that we are defined by sin that we don't acknowledge? If we don't acknowledge our sin and come clean in the presence of God, then that sin can define us. It can make us. It can create a history that we don't want to live. And I pray as your pastor today that none of us will ever be in that place that God has to allow our sins to find us out. But we discover our sin and we bring it to the altar and we say, here it is, God. And if I don't get rid of this, it'll be on the papers. I'll end up being defined by my mistake. I'll be defined by what this says I'm going to be. But God said, you don't have to be defined by that. You, like David, can come and acknowledge your sin and you can repent of your sin and I will change you, wash you, and thoroughly cleanse you from everything you've ever committed. Isn't God good? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Isn't He holy? Isn't He mighty? Isn't He powerful? David said, for I have acknowledged my transgressions. I know what got me in trouble. I know the mistakes that I have made, denying your sin and saying, oh no, I'm good, I'm all right, I'm okay, I I don't need to change. That's a good way to, to be defined by your sin. Because the Bible said, be sure your sins will find you out. But David said, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And if you don't cleanse me, it's going to define me. If you don't wash me, it's going to be on my epitaph. I'm going to die an adulterer. I'm going to die a murderer. I'm going to die like this. But if you can touch me, he said, against thee and thee only have I done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judgest. Now realize something. I did a little research on this scripture and I found out that, that kings could be not, could not be judged by the common people. In other words, the people could not judge David. Only God could judge David for his sin. It would be, it would be God that would bring judgment. And he said, Lord, Anything you need to do, you're justified in whatever you do. Because people don't judge kings. The king judges the king. And he said, I'm a man in authority, but I'm under your authority. And whatever decision you make will be right. If you judge me for my sin, you'll be justified in judging me. If you kill me, if it's adultery, for, if it's stone because of my adultery, then you're justified. You have a right to kill me. You have a right to destroy me. I have no hiding place. There's no place I can run. There's nobody I can run to. And if you decide to pull the trigger and take me out, you have every right to take me out. But if you're not going to take me out, just take me through. And it became a defining moment in David's life. He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. I was born like this. And in sin did my mother conceive me. No, my mother didn't make me a sinner, but I had the propensity to sin the moment I was born. I was born with an Adamic nature. No, sin could not make me sin, but I was born with the propensity to sin. I was apt to sin. My My nature is sinful. 
He begins to describe my nature is sinful. He said, behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me. Make something new. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Have you ever heard somebody tell you, maybe your wife, your spirit's not right? Have you ever had a preacher tell you, your spirit's not right? Something not right about your spirit. David was saying, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. If maybe in the process of life, I picked up a spirit that's not of your spirit. He said, give me a right spirit. Renew me with a right spirit. You know, all you've got to do to be judged and defined by your sin is become the judgment of somebody else's sin. When you start pointing your finger at the sin and the imperfections of other people, you better look out. Sin's about to come down your doorway. Oh God, this is not the day to judge one another's sin or to be looking at the imperfections at people in another church. This is not time to be looking at the imperfections of other people in your family. This is not time to be judging the imperfections. Today, on the very first day of the year, we judge our own imperfections. And we say, God, I bring the mistakes of 2016 into your presence. I bring what I'm not into your presence. I bring what I am into your presence. You know everything even before I get here. You know every mistake. You know every situation. You know everything. But I'm praying today that, that you would not hide uh, hide thy face from my sins, he said, and blot out all mine iniquities. I want you to hide thy face from my sins, but don't hide your face from me. I want you to blot out every one of those iniquities. And he said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me and cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy holy Spirit from me. If there was ever a day that I needed His Holy Spirit. If ever ever there was a day that I needed His righteous Spirit. If there was ever a day that I needed His loving Spirit. And then He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free Spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I was literally touched this morning when I began to think about he was not defined by his sin. I, when, I, when you think about it, think about it with me for a moment. He could have been David the murderer and people only would have been talking about the fact that he murdered. Why is he one of the most preached about characters in history? Because he was smart enough to have a, a, a redefining moment. A moment where he would say, God, if you don't help me, and if you don't touch me, and if I don't acknowledge the sin that is in my life, 
the sin maybe that has been in my life five or ten or fifteen years. I need cleansing. I need washing. I need you to help me. Before I enter into a divorce court or before my children discover who I really am, oh God, help me to be redefined by a moment of coming clean in your presence and saying, God, here's what I am and here's what I'm not, but I'm asking you to redefine me. Oh, I can't tell you. Brother Bear, how many times have you preached about David? Oh yes, as a pastor, we we skirt about his murdering episode. We skirt over the fact that he committed adultery. But nobody wants to stay there long because that's not really who he was. Because he had a Psalm 51 moment that would literally turn him into somebody else. And when God said, now you've been redefined by my mercy because his mercy had been redefined reshaped him and remolded him and gave him a future. Mercy gave him dignity. Mercy gave him honor. It removed him from who he was and made him something that only God could turn him into. I've come to preach to somebody this morning. We're not dying in our sin. We're not dying in our dilemma. We're not going to die an adulterer. We're not going to die a murderer. We're not going to die by the help of all Almighty God, today we shall have a a redefining moment that will take us to the cross of Calvary. The acknowledgement of my mistakes, but I will not be defined by my mistakes. I stand boldly in the presence of God to tell you that I, like everyone in this room, am worthy of death. I am worthy. I'm not worthy of the blood. I'm not worthy of the body. I'm not worthy of the grace. I'm not worthy of the goodness of Almighty God. But today, we have been redefined by His blood and by His grace and by His goodness. I I began to study historically about many people that, that were not successes at first. And we can historically look at many of, of those, and we will here in a moment. But I want to go back to the statement that Benjamin Franklin offered for those in, in, instead of a New Year's resolution. He said, and I quote, he said, Be at war with your vices. And be at peace with your neighbors. And let every new year find you a better man. Be at war with your vices. Be at peace with your neighbors. What David did when he acknowledged his sins, he said, I'm at war at everything that takes me away from God. I will be at war with everything that's not like him. I will be at war with everything that is not does not line up with his word. I will be at war, but I will be at peace with my neighbors. I will be at peace with my family. I will be at peace with my brothers and sisters, but I'm going to be at war, Benjamin Franklin, and said with the vices that come against me with the things that will destroy my marriage with the things that will destroy my home am I in the right church? am I in the right place? with that that will destroy my children I will be at war with vices that take me away from the throne room of his grace but I will be at peace with God Lord cleanse my mind cleanse my heart cleanse my body cleanse my spirit and make me what I need to be in your presence make me what I need to be in your presence there have been many of us that have failed, failed in business, failed in other areas of our life, failed and missed opportunities that we feel are setbacks. When we look at at many people in life, we think, man, they were successful. But nobody talks about their mistakes because Henry Ford was not defined by his mistakes. He wasn't defined by his mistakes. Oh, he went broke five times in business. He was a horrible businessman five times. But he kept moving forward until 
forward today is known by innovation and assembly. It is credited back to him because he would not be defined by bad business. He would not be defined by being unsuccessful five times as a businessman. He just kept moving. He just kept going forward. He just kept getting up and going to work and trying again. And then he kept pushing until he came up with something that would define him. He's not defined as a bad businessman. He's defined as an inventor, as somebody that that created something that is still lasting. Am I in the right church? It's not time to quit. It's not time to make a monument to past mistakes. Get up and dust yourself off and move toward the future that God said you can have. It's not time to be this. She's a gossiper. Not this year. No, I'm going to acknowledge. No, she's a, she's very judgmental. Not this year. I'm not going to be de- defined by who I was. I'm going to be defined by something new. I'm going to acknowledge that I need him more than I've ever needed him in my life. I'm not going to l- allow a bad deal to define me. I'm not going to be defined by a past mistake. I'm not going to be defined by something. R.H. Macy, most people are familiar with the large department store by the name of Macy's. It's become a chain. Some of you wish you were there right now. Somebody said, no, I wish I was at Dillard's. But I'm preaching about Macy's right now. Seven failed Business attempts. But the eighth one was Macy's. Some of you are ready to quit. And you need to get up and dust yourself off. And go one more time. Oh, could this be the year of the turnaround? Could this be the year that suddenly God starts bringing it back? Ah, don't preach that to me. Well, then you sit there and die in your dilemma. But I'm not dying in my bankruptcy. I'm not dying in this situation. My seventh time, my eighth time may be victorious. I may do what What man says cannot be done. Maybe God could choose me for a business proposition that would change the world. Come on, somebody. It's not time to quit. It's not time to to bow down. It's not time to say it's over. It's not time to say it can't be done. It's not time to say "I, I don't have the strength or I'm too dumb or I'm not bright enough. How many of you have ever heard of Albert Einstein? Yeah, when you hear Albert Einstein, you hear genius. It's it's become a synonymous term with genius. But he didn't always have such promise. Einstein did not speak until he was four, did not read until he was seven, causing his teachers and parents to think he was mentally handicapped. Slow and antisocial, they would put on his paper. Eventually, he was expelled from school and was refused admittance to Zurich Polytechnic School. It might have taken him a bit longer, but he was not defined by slow speech or ignorance. He's been defined by genius. I refuse to die here. I refuse to stop here. I refuse to be defined by a mistake, by an addiction. I refuse. I wish somebody would feel that boldness and say, I'm going to have a time of repentance this morning. But when I get up from praying my prayer of repentance like David, I'm going to move with a new courage and a new faith and a new confidence that God's going to help me. Accomplish what I never could have accomplished by myself. People that started slow, that, that, that maybe medical science and family members said, can you imagine looking Thomas Edison in the face as a teacher and said, you're too stupid, Thomas, to learn anything. That's what his teacher told him. Thomas, you're too stupid to learn anything. (laughs) Thomas Edison. Can you imagine what it would take? Work was no better as he was fired from his first two jobs. Thomas, you're stupid. 
Thomas, you're ignorant. Thomas, you'll never amount to anything. Thomas, so even as an inventor, he was unsuccessful 1,000 times. 1,000 times. It's 2017. It's January the 1st. We have 365 blank pages. We have a brand new day and a brand new time and a brand new opportunity. And I feel in my spirit, try, 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 try my spirit and see if I won't forgive you. Try my faithfulness. Try the spirits and see if they're, try mercy, try grace, try faith, try perseverance, try boldness. Try getting up and going again. Try, try, try. Get behind me, Satan. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again. I'm going to worship again. I'm going to praise him again. I'm going to rejoice again. I'm going to believe again. I'm going into business again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to invent again. I'm going to write a book again. And if you just keep trying... The light will come on. God has a way of doing things in us and for us and through us. But it takes effort. It takes trying. You know, can you imagine the mockery that Orville and Wilbur Wright went through? Can you imagine? They battled depression. I didn't realize that that both of them battled depression and family illness before starting a bicycle shop that would lead them to experimenting with flight. And after numerous attempts at creating flying machines, nothing worked. And then they tried again. And then they tried again. And then they tried again. And somehow, they were able not only to get it in the air, they were able to keep it flying. Can I tell you today, this is the year, I believe, of achievement. This is the year of doing and seeing things done that we never believe. This is the year of starting. It's going to be the... the, the, the year of starting something. It's going to be the year of starting something and, 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 and seeing it completed. It's going to be a start. It's going to be a, a time of stepping out. I didn't get to tell uh, many of you the story, but we met in here with our new building committee and the architect, and we began to talk about the future. And so we, we walked out. And I walked out with the owners of that company and I said, you know, I am very excited about uh, the possibility of, of our relationship together. We believe that it's all about relationships and I, 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 I am excited about joining hands with you. And I said, what I feel is the miraculous will not be released until we start. And, uh, They said, that's amazing. Now, these men had no idea. They are Christians themselves. They built CBC where they go to church. And they're very kind men. And they're very God-fearing men. And they support the church that they are a part of. And I I said, I'm I'm very excited about that relationship. He spun and he turned to me. He said, we we are excited about the possibility. We just feel this. And and you're right, Pastor. He said, do you know why the supernatural is going to be released for you in this church? Is because you have activated. Now, they had no idea that my general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church said, go home and activate. And the minute you activate, his sermon title at General Conference was Activate. Because when you activate, there's going to be a release of the supernatural. I want us to get up, dust ourselves off from everything that we have had in our mind, every negative spirit, every negative idea. Sure, we need to improve. Yes, there's things we need deliverance from. Yes, there's things we need to deal with. And we will deal with them. There are attitudes 
which we need to deal with. But God give us the faith to get up right now and dust myself off and move toward the future. I need every musician up here. I need everyone up here. In fact, don't go back there anymore. You stay up here close because we may need a song at the very moment. Don't go back in the cheap seats anymore this year. I need all the musicians to stay right up here because God's going to give us a revival among musicians. He's going to give us a revival among singers. He's going to wash us and cleanse us and sanctify us and make us what we need to be in the kingdom of Almighty God. This is not the year to quit. This is the year to be redefined. Oh, it's a defining moment. I read an amazing book, and I, I don't mind telling you by Bishop T.D. Jakes. He said, no, Some people never reach their defining moment because. They burn three inches from their victory. They die before they get to their promised land. They give up. They stop. They're not defined. They're not pushed. They don't keep moving. They don't have faith. They say, I can't take it anymore. And he said, the minute those kind of words start coming out of your mouth, he said, you're almost finished. What do you mean? When he says, cast all of your care upon me, for I care for you. It's a defining moment. We're either going to be destroyed or we're going to get up and dust ourselves off and move to the future that he has designed. I can't have your future, Desiree, only you can. I can't have your future, Jolene, only you get your future. I don't know what your future is. I, I, I can't tell you what your future is. But whether you get it or not will not be determined by anybody in this room. It will only be determined by you and your choices. We have a man that we are very proud of. Phil Carney, we are very proud of you. Accepted this year at the University of Texas. Working on his doctorate. Accepted to the doctorate program. We have now several doctors in this church but if they could take you back to their life they could show you setback after setback they could show you some set down situations they could show you grief and anxiety and pain but what has made them who they are is they had redefining moments every time we have a fast and if you don't fast this one This is not trying to set you up to gauge whether or not you're going to fast every day. But every time we've called a seven-day fast, I knew he went on it because his face was drawn and his suits looked too big. And I said, here's a principal of a school that's been fasting, only drinking water for the last seven days, following his pastor and his church to do all Those are defining moments. That's what makes you who you are. This kind cometh not but by much prayer and fasting. That's defining moments. That's what defines us. But today at the first of the year, we get to come to the altar. We get to come and say, God cleanse me all over again. Lest my sin destroys me. Lest my lust and my perversion consumes me. Lest I am defined in the chapter of my life shows me as something horrible. But the beauty of the author and the beauty of the finisher is nobody controls the pen but him. I got drunk last year. I got high last year. I committed a horrible sin last year. I'm going through things nobody knows about. I did things... I'm involved in an affair nobody knows. I'm involved in situations. I watch stuff, I read stuff that if it was put up on the screen, I would be totally and publicly humiliated. 
David said today. They won't have to tell you. Today I acknowledge my sins. I acknowledge my transgressions. I know you know everything right in my life. And I know you know everything wrong in my life. And today I don't want to be defined by the wrong. I want to be defined by your mercy. I want to be redefined by your grace. I want to be redefined as only you can define me. Would you take your wife and your children by the hand and would you make your way to this altar this morning? And would you come by family? This can be a defining moment. This can be a redefining moment for all of us. Would you recommit wives to your husbands? And would you recommit husbands to your wife? And would you recommit mother and father to your children? And Brother Peeper, if you'll come and stand right here in the front end, would you get me two or three chairs and put here? And uh, if you have trouble standing... Don't be, you won't offend us at all. Bring me several chairs. Just face the pulpit. And bring me two or three chairs. And if, if you're unable to stand for a long period of time, you just come and sit right here. And if you need to sit on the first or the second row, that'll be fine. It's, it's mothers a prayer. It's fathers a It's prayer warriors in this church that's going to keep us all where we need to be. And today, like David, we come with a Psalm 51 now. Now, you can't quote David's psalm and it be a, a psalm of repentance for you. Only you can repent for you. Only you know you. But there can be a redefining moment in your life. God, search me. God, wash me. I want us to repent together. Every musician, play but repent. Every, every, repent. No singing yet. Play but repent. Everybody, God, forgive me. Lord, wash me. Lord, cleanse me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Lord, it was Your mercy that redefined David. Let mercy redefine us today. Don't let alcohol make us who we are. Let mercy redefine us. Don't let, don't let us be cursed by sin, but let us be blessed by Your mercy and grace. Redefine us today. God, make us what we need to be. Don't let our mistake define us, but cleanse me. Wash me. If you need to kneel, then you feel free to kneel. Lord, cleanse me and wash me and make me what I need to be. Cleanse my heart, my soul, and my mind. Redefine my mind, my heart. My mind's not right. My heart's not right. Don't let me in the weariness of my body make wrong decisions. Cleanse me and wash me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. Thank You, Lord. Let Your mercy redefine who I am. Let me be tender. Let, let Take out every judgmental spirit. Help me, O oh God, today to see my wrong, not the wrongs of anybody else. But Lord, as we approach the communion table, wash me and cleanse me. Help me, O oh God. You know, I acknowledge my sins, my transgressions every thought, every evil imagination, everything I've watched, everything I've done, everything I've said that's not pleasing to You, cleanse me and wash me. Let this day, let this day of repentance, let this day of washing and cleansing define me. Define me, Lord. Define me. Redefine me. In the name of Jesus. Let this be a year when people's lives are completely changed. Where their spirits are changed. Where their lives are changed. 
God, help us to refocus on sinners. That's what David said. If you'll redefine me, I'll get my focus back on the lost. If you'll redefine me, I'll get my focus back on reaching somebody that's in worse shape than I am. If you'll redefine me, I'll get my mind back on reaching lost people and hurting people and wounded people. I'll teach transgressors thy ways if you'll redefine me. Don't let me be defined by my error. Redefine me, mercy. Redefine me, grace, so that I can help the next generation to find you. Help me, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Would you just reach over maybe to your wife? Forgive me, honey, for not being what I need to be. Help me to be a better husband. Help me to be a better wife. Help me to be more faithful. Forgive me. Forgive me for being sharp. Forgive me for being angry. Forgive me. Forgive me. God, help me. Lord, help me. To not be defined by my mistake. Let it be the year of comeback. Let it be the year of strength. Let it be the year of renewed commitment. Let it be the year. Yes, Lord. A defining moment. A defining week. We're about to enter into prayer and fasting. Let us be defined by by the future that only you can give us. God, redefine us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Brother Baker.